welcome all. Uh, I'm Nat and I am Head of Community at Exceptional Individuals. I see a few familiar names. For those of you who do not know, we support those who are neurodivergent. So things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism and OCD. Now, a lot of people wonder, is OCD a neurodivergence? Well, it is, but the reason why it's not a clear yes is because a lot of neurodivergence is just, it's not a disability necessarily. It's because the world is neurotypical that there's that extra strain on the brain and you find things more challenging. But OCD is still seeing the world differently and processing information in another way. But why that's a little bit different is it is definitely a mental health condition because it's, it can make the brain almost impossible to, to work with sometimes. And I last year got diagnosed with OCD after years of battling with it and not having any idea what it is. So I can say from a personal perspective, it's, uh, it's very, very different from things like dyslexia or autism where I have learned to see those things very much as a positive. That's not to say, however, that there are not positives related to OCD, but we'll go into a bit about that later. It'll be a fairly lighthearted session, you know, nothing, uh, nothing too taxing. When we normally talk about neurodivergence, we talk about things like dyslexia, which is about reading, dyspraxia, which can be about motor processing, autism, which is kind of social skills and how you interpret the world, and ADHD, hyperactive um, deficit, no, <laughs> attention deficit hyperactive disorder, which is kind of like the brain focusing on different bits and putting all its attention in certain areas. But there are lots of others, like uh, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, even like Tourette's would also come under that. As for exceptional individuals, for those of you who aren't aware, we are a neurodivergent organisation. See that lovely background? That's all of our team. And we support people find work, support in work, workshops and guides, everything related to neurodivergence. But I won't go into too much detail right now because I said it quite a lot in other presentations. When we talk about different ways of thinking, we often use this spiky profile. So someone who is not neurodivergent would be, you know, that they're okay at all sorts of things, but might not necessarily be a particular specialist in one area. If you tend to specialize in one area and not so much in another, you have this more fluctuation of abilities, that is what we would call neurodivergent. Now with OCD, it's a little bit different. So there might be things that the brain is able to do completely calmly, not even have to worry, not even to think second nature. And then there'll be other things where it kind of gets like locked onto. And that is what we call the deficit. Now, what we aim to do is to minimize the negative effects of OCD, but also to find the things that the brain is able to comfortably fix on in a non-distressing way and to really promote that. But essentially it's obsessive compulsive disorder. And the two words there, obsessive and compulsive are two parts of the diagnosis. So we're gonna be looking at both sections today. Obsessions, just so we have a basic definition, are frequent, unwelcome and intrusive thoughts. So things that kind of come into the head that you did not ask for, you do not want, and are not easy to get rid of. For those of you who have been able to log on to menti.com, all I want you to do is on your phones or desktop is to click which one is something you think personally you spend the most time obsessing on. Is it being extra clean, making sure that things are really neat? Is it danger? So you think everything's out to get you or you're always worried about health complications. Um, another thing could just be forgetting things. So maybe every time you leave the house, you're like, ah, did I lock the door or did I leave the oven on? Anything like that. Most of you have put forgetting things, which is interesting because it's been proven one of the most common forms of OCD normally revolves around cleanliness or organisation which is by far what everyone thinks of when they think of OCD, but actually that's just a tiny, tiny bit. There's so much more. 
All right, next one. Oh, and uh, excuse my poor spelling, dyslexic after all. What do you, what do your obsessive thoughts interfere with the most? So when you get these thoughts or your brain wanders, is it your personal life, you know, your family, your loved ones that take a hit? Is it your social life? So friends going out, having fun, being able to relax, or is it day to day in the office or work, which you find can be the most strain? Personal life, social life, work life. I think for me, OCD is something which can definitely affect across the spectrum. It's not particularly like one or the other. And that can make it quite difficult. I remember on, it has one of those things that has a knock on effect but being able to find one place where you're able to unwind and relieve that kind of mental baggage can be really helpful. Um, it's important to know that a lot of people who have OCD also have comorbid conditions, which means something else. So it's quite common to have ASD, autism, ADHD, it's very common to have depression or bipolar, anxiety, and they all kind of come as a set. So very common if you have one that you could possibly have another. All right, moving sharply on. How much, how much do your obsessive thoughts distress you? So we've got a scale of none to all the time. Now, all the time is you are literally incapable of doing anything else because it's all consuming. And none is that, well, you don't really have any compulsive thoughts. You know, you're very much in control of your thoughts. And, uh, and what you want to choose. But when I say in control, it's very, very normal for your brain to wonder. You know, wondering is completely normal, but when it becomes like into a point where it negatively impacts you, so you could go out on your day-to-day -day basis and you're always thinking about, I mean, either like pain or hurting yourself or overly dependent on like thinking of sexual thoughts, or it could be of alcohol abuse, it could be scratching, it could literally be anything whatsoever, but it's when this kind of thing gets kind of like stuck. I always think of my brain a bit like a, a conveyor belt, you know, that just keeps going around and around. There are moments when I get a break, but I know it's just kind of coming out again. And through things like CBT, which is types of therapy, tends to be the best approach but medication is also available. And I think I do touch upon that a little bit at the end. So a lot of you have said mid midway, and that's about average, you know, that is not something you should worry about too much. But when it starts to become all the time, this is definitely when we need to think, okay, maybe I should go see a, a doctor or a therapist or get some help because it's not normal for the brain to fixate all the time. How do you try to resist your obsessions? So feel free to write on your phone, or if, you've, if you're not on that and you just want to write in the chat, please write in the chat, because I'd really like to know, maybe we can help each other here. If you've got a thought in your head, like maybe even if it's like an annoying song or something that's been bugging you, how can, what do you, is there anything you do to get rid of it? And uh, may I just say, as Christmas is fast approaching, there's going to be lots of Christmas songs that I know I won't be able to get out of my head. That's not OCD, by the way, but it still gives you uh, hopefully a little bit of empathy of what it might be like on a very, very mild case by case basis to try deep breathing or if it's to or if it sounds like a song, little, try listening to something else. And that's a good idea when it comes to like different sounds. I always think when my brain gets kind of stuck in a rut, the only thing that works for me is finding something else to replace it. Now, easier said than done, you know, um, like for instance, I might like, you know, like pull out hairs on my face and that can get into like a habit or a routine. So I might have like an elastic band around my wrist and kind of like pinch it. And what that does is changing the, the, the pattern and the routine to another area. I'm not saying it always works, but that does work some of the times and for some people more than others. Another good message is deep breathing. So I always get my hand like that, right? Put my mouth in there, 
and go and just do a couple of deep breaths in hold for four seconds release and they taught me that in therapy as well and the reason you do your hand there is because when you're in public it can be a bit embarrassing to be like <gasps> but if you're like people might it's less obvious um so i find that helps a lot barbara has said i tell myself that unwanted thoughts do happen and i should accept them and let them pass that is really good Ex rather than being in denial like don't think of it don't think of it just thinking it happens thoughts come in thoughts go out and there's two minds of thought some people will just try to ignore things but others will ground themselves and ask themselves how am i currently feeling where is the pain where is my brain going allow it to be kind of felt it does seem in some ways a bit kind of meditation-y, hippie-like, but it does work. And it's one of those things you've really got to give a good try. Alex has said, distract myself by watching a movie, but it's a temporary solution. And yeah, that's very true. I would, for me, I listen to music really loud in, like, in my ears just to get my mind moving. That, however, is not a great solution because one, it could damage your ears. And as soon as the music stops, it comes back again. So things like cognitive therapy, like CBT ten, or meditation tend to be the most effective long term. Um, but as long as whatever your solution is doesn't damage you or hurt you or anyone else, then if it works for you, amazing. Another one said here, I try and distract myself with music or sometimes that excites me and for harder days I just slap my wrists or rock myself and that's another good one again it goes back to the thing I mentioned as long as you're not hurting yourself it's fine so the thing with like elastic bands or like a little slap it's fine but if you start doing it to the point where you get bruises or cuts that's when you've got to think this isn't a good sustainable solution uh but kind of like rocking you know tapping your fingers drawing doodling anything where you're transferring that impulse or urge can be really beneficial but these are really great suggestions honestly okay the next one i got uh is how much control do you have over your obsessive thoughts so when something comes in your mind is it something you can completely have control over. Cool, did not want to think about whether I locked the house or not. Some, oh my God, maybe I did lock it. It'll probably be, it'll probably be okay. Uh, like little control, oh dear, maybe I should go back. Or no control, I'm probably not gonna leave the house today because I don't want to forget to lock the door. So you can see how the spectrum can be quite large. I think control's a hard word, isn't it? Like, what do we actually mean by control? Sometimes it's like, okay, so maybe you're worried about cleanliness. And even though you have that anxiety about making sure things are always clean, for example, you're still able to put that aside and carry on with your life. But if you get to a section where you cannot move on and you you have an anxiety attack or real panic or real stress if you're if you don't fulfill that kind of OCD requirement of like scrubbing or checking that is another thing when it's probably time to look into it a little bit further I think people get kind of confused between having an intrusive thought and having OCD they're, they're very different it's like depression and being depressed are very different being, getting depressed is normal, it's part of life. We all have good days and bad days, but if it's a continuous mood that kind of like slumps and affects everything else in your life for a prolonged period, that is not normal. And that is something that we can look into and hopefully improve. All right, so we've done obsessive. Now we're on to the second bit, and this is compulsions. So compulsions are repetitive behaviors or mental acts you have a strong urge to repeat that are aimed at reducing your anxiety or presenting some. <clears throat> so what do we actually mean by that? Let's break it down. Compulsions are repetitive behaviours 
So things that you do all the time could be like pulling hair, could be scratching skin, could be having a continuously clean, could be, you know, making sounds, anything that you do repeatedly. And it's something that you have this like urge for. Think about like if any of you smoke, it's, you, you can really stop yourself if you don't want to, but the urge is almost too great when you're addicted to something. Having OCD, I could imagine being quite similar to those who are addicted to drugs, but it's kind of like a natural drug that the brain kind of needs to get in order to release. And the, the, if one of the key things is reducing anxiety or presenting it, so you wouldn't do it for enjoyment. If you're doing it for enjoyment or doing it for a certain feeling, um, that's not OCD. If you're doing it because you feel better afterwards, even as Alex said with films, only for a short time, that would kind of come under OCD. So if it aims to present, prevent things, now it might actually prevent things in the short term, but then the more you do it, the less and less time it will make you feel better to the point you end up doing it all the time. And that makes OCD quite dangerous because it's something which can spiral it can start off as a mild inconvenience and before long, it's something which can consume the whole life. So if you start to see symptoms getting worse, this is definitely when you should go and seek help and support. Uh, because it, what, all I can say is from a personal perspective, it's easy to get those habits, very difficult to get rid of them. Not impossible, but prevention is definitely better than cure in most cases, but particularly this case. Now the next one I'd like to ask you is how much time do you spend performing compulsive behaviours a day? Now is it less than an hour on roughly every two hours all the way to over 12 hours max? And this could be about any obsession or compulsive thought you can think of. Is it something which only happens a few times a day or is it something which is almost constant whether or not you find it easy to control, even if it's very mild. And this can tell you when something is just a compulsion, like oh, we should do that, or something which is quite problematic. An idea of a compulsion is, you know, when you're kind of walking on the streets and you see pavement slabs and there's different cracks and you like to avoid them. As a kid, we always like to play a game. You know, if you step on a crack, you break your back. That's a bit of fun. But if you have to do that, or if you're in a room and you have to count one, two, three, every time you do an activity, that's also could resonate with OCD. And a lot of these kind of things, I'm sure a lot of you are resonating with, like, man, I do that. Uh, I didn't even know it was part of OCD. I thought it was just me. Whenever I'm in stressful situations, I always have to count to three, one, two, three. Uh, another thing where my OCD affects me personally is the number 23. I don't know why that number, but I see it everywhere. It, it very much is an obsession. Everything I see adds up to it. If I see like chairs or maths or people's names, my brain will try and fix a puzzle in order to get to that number. It used to be a bit of a quirk, like, ah, that's a bit quirky. And to the point where I start seeing it more and more. I've been able to control it now after working on it, but that is one example. Thomas has said, uh, if I was scratching a lot bef before uh, my arm and it hurt, okay. <laughs> so if you scratch a lot, doesn't matter where you are, it can still really, that could be an issue. So for a bit itchy, scratch, fine. Do it all day, you're gonna have cuts, not ideal. Now the most of you have said uh, eight hours, now, eight hours is a big portion of your day. And that is what I would probably say is compulsive or unreasonable or unhealthy. If it's like an hour a day, you know, maybe it's something you can manage um, because we're all on the spectrum. But when it becomes a good chunk of your day, that is probably something which would require a GP or someone else to see what's going on and how they can relieve it. All right, now next one is how much do you compulse over the following? So 
So on this one, you can move things around in the order. So which one you think you spend the most time. And again, feel free to in the chat to put it there if you don't have access to Menti. Now, if some of you are going through this and you're like, yep, this is definitely me, that doesn't mean you have OCD. But if all, if you're like ticking a lot of these boxes, all of these different questions, and you're all coming out quite high, that would suggest a very strong likelihood that you have to some level. I know for me, I'm not officially diagnosed with OCD. I'm diagnosed with OCD tendencies. And I think that that kind of refers to ticking some of the boxes, but not all of them. And it doesn't really make much difference to me. I still have it, you know, it's, it's still something that I live with on a day-to-day -day basis. And some days are easier, some days are not. Sometimes I can go through months of a really low patch. Other times it could be months completely well and healthy. Does it have consistency? Not really, but it can also relate to seasonal. So if you've got SAD, you know, seasonal affective disorder. Now, this is quite interesting. So when it comes to compulsion, a lot of you have, well, the most have said eating. And that would include, imagine that you either choose not to eat or you're always counting calories. That, co that counts as a compulsion. Or maybe that you, when, when you're going out, you always have to eat takeaway or you always have to eat certain types of food. Uh, it, this relates quite heavily to autism because it's quite common for people who are on the autistic spectrum to eat the same meal every day because they like reput repetition. It gives them comfort. Yet with OCD, it's more of a, it helps the anxiety. Life gets really tense. And by eating something or not eating something, it relieves that built up stress. Uh, checking or counting is the second popular. Uh, I don't know if popular is the right word, but this could be just making sure everything is counted. You know, is the door shut? Is the cooker on? Have I taken the bins out? Have I picked up the kids? Uh, have I been on this website today? It can be as lighthearted as did I get this newspaper? And if I didn't get this newspaper, I feel really anxious. Or it could be something far, far more severe where, okay, if I haven't hurt yourself in some particular way, you're going to feel a lot worse later on. Some people who have who are quite religious will often like do continuous praying because they feel they need to condone for like sins. And when it happens so much that it consumes their whole existence, that's when it becomes a negative. But just wanting to pray, you know, a few times a day isn't a compulsion. So hopefully you're starting to see the, how we change it. Hoarding. So hoarding is actually its own reg recognized disorder, but it also comes under OCD quite heavily. If you find it very difficult to get rid of stuff um, or just hold on to things, always thinking it might be used to later down the line, counts. And shopping, it turns out no one's picked that one, but some people are really bad with spending. Maybe it could be at a casino or on Amazon. I'm sure, I don't know if any of you this Black Friday just went all over the place, you know? Next one is, how anxious would you feel if you were prevented from performing your compulsive behavior? Completely fine or have a, almost an anxiety attack? So imagine this, whether it's like, if you're not allowed to clean something or yourself, how stressed would that make you? If you're not allowed to go back and check if the oven's left on, how does that make you feel? If you're not able to scratch yourself or like pluck a skip hair, what would be the result? Is it something you could live with or is it something that would consume you until you're able to satisfy that urge? If it tends to be the latter, the anxiety area, that again would indicate OCD tendencies. So Alex said, uh, hoarding can be related to strong autistic attachments to objects. Yeah, that's true. And a lot of people with autism also have OD OCD tendencies, like I said about comorbid conditions. And all I ask is if any of you did want the slides today, if you email me, I'll be able to send it to you because we're doing it in a bit of an interactive way. I have to export it slightly differently. 
All right, we're almost there. We're doing really well. Now, again, either in the chat or on Menti, what is something you can pulse over? And I think why I want to ask this is to show everyone in this webinar that there are so many different things. It's not as simple as being organized, making sure pens are in the right position, or I've counted number of floor tiles above me. It really can be so wide and diverse. This is why it's quite difficult to go to particular groups because having the empathy for someone else isn't always easy. It's like autism, it's so diverse. One person with autism is one person with autism. Now, someone has very bravely uh, said, picking at my skin. That is quite a common one. And a lot of people then have to wear bandages or can get scars. So one way that doctors or therapists or support organizations might do to combat that could be to give something else to fiddle with. So you know, like kind of fidget toys or when fidget spinners were a thing, anything which is able to take that distraction and move it along. Now bear in mind, easier said than done. This is not an easy process, but knowing that it is possible means that it's worth a try. Uh, we've got another message here, which says, if I can't wash my hands when I feel the need to, I feel really uncomfortable. Is, and then another one is, is nail biting related to OCD. And <laughs> I can testify to that, absolutely. But I really want to be clear that just because you bite your nails doesn't mean you have OCD. But if you bite your nails to the point you're actually in pain and you do it so often and it gives you a sense of relievement when you do so, then that is when it might actually start relating. But I think, Barbara, you're right there. When it comes to, it, it, it doesn't always have to be extreme. So if you wash your, if you don't like wash your hands, it's not the end of the world. But if you get that kind of butterfly feeling, that sense of uneasiness that will last for quite some time, either until you're able to wash your hands again or until a lot, lot later, that again would come, come under it. So remember, anything that is impulsive and anything that is um, compulsive <laughs> come, comes under it. It really does have quite a wide remit. Now, this is what I would like to understand a lot more. How do you manage your compulsive behaviors? So some of you have mentioned that you have to wash all the time, you, you pick at your skin, uh, all these different things. But what do you do to support yourself? Are there any things that are tried and tested and works for you? For me, it definitely is having multi-sensory information. So if I'm reading a book, I have to listen to the audio book and read it at the same time because then it, it gives most of, you know, it, it makes sure my brain doesn't have too much freedom to like wander around. Uh, I always have to be playing with something while talking to someone. Essentially, whenever I'm doing something, I have to make sure that at least two or more of my senses are being fulfilled in order to keep my brain on track. This is actually why we made this presentation so interactive because I find it very difficult to focus if I'm not able to keep it busy. Uh, so imagine if I'm not fiddling with something, I'll end up kind of like scratching myself. If, I'm, if the conversation isn't engaging me in, on an intellectual basis, I'll start thinking of pain and I'll start getting like always feeling I'm ill going to hospitals, going to the doctors, phoning up emergency lines, I'm thinking I'm really sick. I remember when, you know, the pandemic broke out, I was so convinced I had it to the point where I was having the symptoms. The body is a marvelous, but also a, a scary thing sometimes, where you can actually make yourself ill by thinking you have something, even though you do not have it. And that is a type of OCD. Okay, great, Nat. You told me that, uh, I have a strong likelihood of OCD or the people I support have OCD or at least have a lot of the characteristics of it. What now? Where do I go for support? And we're based in the UK, but we can help worldwide and there's lots of great organizations. 
And imagine you're trying to, you, you think you have OCD, whether you're diagnosed or not diagnosed, and you're still kind of struggling, to be honest, finding a job. Maybe it's because, you know, your routines or quirks, or whatever you want to call them, make you feel a bit of an outcast or you feel self-conscious, or maybe they actually do stop you from achieving certain goals. Well, we can help you find a job which has that flexibility, you know, is able to support you and see you for what you're able to do and not what you can't do. We also do training for teams to make sure that every organization is as clued up as possible to get rid of some of the stigmas. Consultancy, uh, employee support. So again, if any of you are looking for support, we're based in the UK, but we can normally support people all over depending on where they are. And anything work related, we'll do our absolute best in order to help you. If it comes, however, to being diagnosed or any medical help, this is when I would highly suggest going to see a GP. Now, here's another one, which uh, I always mention because I think it would be a shame not to. If you're in the UK, and I'm afraid it doesn't apply to other countries, but there is actual government a grant available called Access to Work, and you can either do it via us or can do it independently, where as long as you have a job, we can get you training and support in uh, order to help you. I'm not sure what the rest of you think, those who are based in Germany or India, but the UK's mental health support with the NHS, I've been under it, it's not great. I mean, the, pe the staff are amazing, you know, they will go above and beyond to help you, but sadly they do not have the resources or the equipment, or frankly, the current knowledge in order to give the maximum help. And I found that unless you have money, it can be quite hard to find good support. Uh, so if something like this is available to you, where you can get support for free, I would say take it with open arms. If this is something you're interested in, you can always check out our website, um, or I can always send up a following email after. All right, now that was the main section. Now I'm just going to do a really fun last quiz uh, to, to end it. And this is just four questions around OCD. And it's mainly about myth busting to see what you think, is this right? You know, like that. Now, I know most of you are not actually on here at the moment. So you feel free to just reply in the chat, but we'll, we'll give it a good go. So paperclip, there's a high likelihood you might win on this. All right. so. One in how many adults have OCD? Now, this is for adults. Well, the diagnosis in children tend to be a lot higher and we'll go into age range later on. But yes, you got it right. So they think, or some adults estimate that one in 50 uh, or children, one in 100. But I think one in 100 is probably a safe estimate Obviously, they're always a little bit conservative. And I see Barbara said 15. It's very difficult to get reliable stats. But the one that is most frequently quoted is one in 15. Now, bear in mind, this is for quite severe OCD. But in terms of like a much more milder, that could be you know, far, far, far more likely. Uh, but as you can probably guess, it's quite difficult because the, most of the statistics come from doctor surgeries. And if it's not quite severe, you probably wouldn't go to the doctor. But just know that it's far more common than yeah, the public would talk about. How'd it go? Hello. <laughs> yeah. Right, two or four. It was okay. I think what... Oh, who's talking? I hate doing it. Yeah. Oh, okay, there we are. Two or four. Sorry, I just had to uh, mute Sarah. <laughs> now, OCD may emerge at any time, but most commonly appears around years old. So what age range is OCD most likely to start to show itself? Yes. So 
around 10 to 12 is when most people get diagnosed or show signs. But the most common time it's from, oh yeah, I see Boris at 15, 18. It normally is from around 10 to 19. So from early teenage years to late teenage years is when most people end up getting picked up or diagnosed or sh start showing it. And where like other things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism are lifelong conditions that you are born with, OCD is something that for one reason or another can develop at any age. I got mine, well, I got mine. Uh, I, I realized mine was a challenge in my life uh, two years ago and that's when it became quite severe. But looking back on it in hindsight, I've had tendencies throughout my childhood. Okay, now three or four is, oh, always forget to put enter. Guys doing pretty good at the moment. OCD conditions include what disorders? So out of these ones, hoarding, um, body dysmorphic, hair pulling or skin picking, which ones are included? Now this is good because we spoke about this today. They actually all are. So hoarding is definitely part of OCD, um, but it also is registered as its own condition. I've been working with someone with hoarding um, disorder at the moment and it really can be quite debilitating. It's not as simple as let's just chuck out that stuff. Um, body dysmorphic, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, can be about you know making sure you always look good or like always doing skincare routines or always kind of got to make pluck the eyebrows like when you're kind of obsessive about your body and you could argue that you know most teenage girls um but also it's men as well it affects both demographics of all ages hair pulling is really common it might just be the odd hair you start you might find ways to rationalize it like I know you do it because it's a split end or, you know, it's dead or it's broke or my nail is already chipped anyway. That could be quite a common thing of justifying it. And you normally do that to cover things up or to make yourself not feel as bad. But when you start to become more self-aware, which in fairness might require some inter intervention, that is a, a sign to look into. Uh, <laughs> I know for me, I only realized I had a problem with like nails and stuff when they like start to bleed and you don't want it to get to that stage. And last one, skin picking, which we mentioned. Now, four of four. So the last one, and this is a quick one. Oh, here we are. Obstacles to getting treatment for OCD include. So what out of these are some of the biggest barriers in order to individuals seeking help? Is it that they end up hiding their symptoms? Is it therapy, stigma, lack of proper training in health professionals or medicine? Now, three of these are correct. So one of the biggest things is hiding symptoms. You could be working with someone with OCD and never even know it because it's not always obvious. Sometimes it's always like in the mind and you might not actually demonstrate any physical symptoms. So you expect to see someone always scrubbing or clicking their nails, but it doesn't always have a very visual presence. Uh, therapy is actually a good thing. <laughs> so it's hard to come by. It's still an emerging field, but studies have proven that CBT therapy when you start to listen to your body and understand it and trying to accept the feelings rather than exclude them has proven to be the most effective method. Stigma, that just means people's negative connotations and understandings of it are outdated. Sadly, OCD is one of those things which the media uses to make fun of, like, oh, you know, you're so OCD. There's no such thing as being a bit OCD. If you ever hear someone say, oh, he's a bit OCD, I would say correct them because it's not a fair assumption. It's a very serious medical condition. So just because you're a bit, you know, you have 
a mild obsession or compulsion, like fleeting coming in and out, that is not OCD. And it actually does a disservice to people who have it. Uh, next one is lack of proper training in health professions. This is a really big one. And this is a big mountain for all of us to climb over. So many professionals might have training in therapy, for example, but do not have training in OCD. It, it's, it's, it's its own kind of separate field. So if you are going to a doctor or a physician or anyone for help, make sure that they have the correct training and understanding and knowledge to be able to support you with that. Um, it took me like I know, six doctors um, of a course over two years to find the right one who was able to help me. Uh, so many of them just kind of misstood or misdiagnosed as something completely different. So remember that doctors aren't all equal. If, if you're not getting the results you want, I say it is a, is a bit of a battle and it shouldn't be that way, but do not give up. There's always hope. I was at, I was, uh, at my wits end, but eventually getting help was a lifesaver. And then we've got medication. So medication can be used for OCD. It doesn't mean it's essential. It doesn't mean that everyone has to. A lot of people will prefer to do more um, herbal or natural or, I can't remember the word, but you know, holistic, like holistic methods. And that could be meditating. It could be coming with like calming yourself down, but, Medication is definitely something which shouldn't be stigmatized. For me, I got told time and time again, do not have medication. You know, you'll regret it, you'll get stuck on it, you'll get hooked and addicted. And to be honest for you, is the only thing that worked for me. The therapy kind of worked, but the, the medication was able to get me back on track. I'm on something called sertraline, which is normally used as an antidepressant, but is can also use to minimize the effects of OCD. Now there are cons there are um, side effects, but you've always got to ask yourself, are the side effects worse than what you're currently going through? And nothing is forever, but this is something where it's individual case by case. I am not a medical professional. I'm not going to say which one's better or worse for you, but there are things out there which can help. And if one thing doesn't work, there are so many different things you can try because everyone's bodies work differently. Oh, now we get to see who's the winner. Is it Nemo or Anna? Oh, nice. It is Nemo. Well done, Nemo. Today you are a winner. Now we've got 10 more minutes. Are there any questions, again, either on this or in the chat that you would like me to try and answer or any comments? And this could be anything, either from personal experience or from another area. And if I know, I'll tell you. And if I don't, I'll go out of my way and try and find the correct answer and the correct person who does. Okay, so Alex has said, can picking skin just be a sensory issue when you really have to do, or is it not smooth or that would fall under? Okay, so what you're saying now, I think like, can it just be something you do for a sensory to receive kind of feedback? Um, or like, if you don't like the texture? And I think, again, it can, it can overflow. You know, one thing and the other thing, they're different, but they're all so similar. So when it comes to like autism spectrum disorder, it is very sensory and it is going to be about touch or not liking certain feelings or textures. And that can be separate. But if that starts to become such an issue where you're unable to use certain materials or certain feelings um, or very distressed as a result of doing something, that is when it would become uh, obsessive compulsion. So remember that it's very common to have both. Uh, now, we've also got another one saying, if I was on medication, would I have to take it for life? That is a really good question. And the answer is no. Now, how long you're on it, it really depends. I have been on mine now for a few years. And to be honest with you, I don't see me coming off of it anytime soon. But what it, how it works is that it takes a long time to work. So for mine, it took about 
three to six months before I started to see real side effects. And I had to start on like very small amounts and each month or so slightly building up it until it was in my system. And now when I want to come off of it, I have to do it very slowly because the chemicals in the bodies can change. So it's not something you're like, I'm better now, I should stop. If you, when you're ready to come off of it and you feel in yourself, you can slowly start to decrease dosage. Um, but I really want to emphasize that this is a conversation you need to have with your doctor. But no, it's not for life. But as far as people are aware, there aren't any negatives to taking it long term. I've done my research on that. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, are there any other questions? Well, in that case, if you guys would just like to say how you found today. Now, this was actually the last webinar we're doing of this year, but next year we have sessions go booked all the way for a year in advance. Um, from, you know, what is autism to ADHD to dyspraxia to helping with your CV to assistive technologies. And we're in a very privileged position where we're able to do them completely free of charge. Always on Thursdays, always at the same time. So I highly encourage you to sign up nice and early and it will make sure that you guaranteed get a place uh, because some of them tend to be really popular, particularly around autism or dyslexia, but all of them hopefully you could get some real insight from. As no one did this screen, I'm just gonna say it was great. <laughs> Uh, oh, I've got one other question. I know there are compulsions in mind as counting, but is it a compulsion to think, oh, I have to think this or else. Yes, that is very much compulsion. So like I gave the example of praying, if I do not pray, then I will be punished. Or if I do not clean, I will get ill. If I do not I don't know, do that, then this will happen. That is very, very common. So yeah, you're, you're, you're right on that. Now, as often, how to get in touch. So you can always go to our website, exceptionalindividuals.com, and we have lots of support and you know stuff there, or you can just get in touch. So either admin at accept.co.uk or to contact me directly, it's just nat, N-A-T. There's our number. Be mindful, we're breaking up soon for Christmas but follow us on our socials and I hope you enjoyed and were able to get something useful out of it. It was just the tip of the iceberg and this is only a starting point for a conversation, but hopefully it was enough of a springboard to uh, get the mind thinking. Bye all and thanks for your kind words. <laughs>